Uh, today, we're going to be talking about, do we need a new prescription? Uh, let's say a prayer and get started. Father, thank you in Jesus' name for being here with us, for that beautiful music, man, uh, for that story of learning how to serve, and Lord, for those songs. We thank you so much for your love and your grace. Be with us now as we break open your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Do we need a new prescription? How many people here have always worn glasses? Yeah, me too. And, and I tried the contact thing, and it just doesn't work well for me. And I guess, um, and I'm too a chicken to do LASIK, LASIK surgery. How many of you are brave enough to actually do LASIK? Yeah, let me know. how. How's that going? Going good? All right, I'm still nervous. I don't know, man. But, you know, whatever the case may be, uh, do we need a new prescription today? We're going to find out. And, and what I submit to us today is that to be successful in our Christian journey, we need to view life using whose perspective? God's perspective. And so whatever perspective it is that you have, probably your own, um, we want to change that to God's prescription if we are to be successful in our Christian journey. And we're going to talk about two different areas that we need to perhaps change our prescription. The first having to do with time. We're going to look at time first. And to do that, we're going to go to Genesis chapter 2. Verses 1 through 3. And and last time, uh, we had you read, and you all did such a good job. We're going to continue it this time. So um, I'll I'll get us started off of this first one. But after that, um, the text right below the one that's larger is the text we're going to next. And so I'll kick off with Genesis 2, 1 through 3. Pastor Bill, if you're willing to jump into Exodus 28 through 11 and then pass it on. And if you don't want to read, just pass it quickly to the next person so we can be ready to go. Genesis 2, 1 through 3. How can we view God's perspective as it relates to time? Well, let's see. Genesis 2, of course, Genesis 2, talking about the creation of this world. And it says here in Genesis 2, 1 through 3, Thus the heavens and earth were completed and all their hosts. By the seventh day, God completed his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all the work which God had created and made. So that's what God did here in Genesis. He creates the world six days, seven day. He does some things that we read. He, he rests, he blessed, and he sanctifies it. He sets it apart. Let's see what else occurs here as it relates to this time aspect that we could use God's perspective help. Exodus 20, 8 through 11. Let's go for it. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath unto Jehovah thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days... God made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, Jehovah God blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Hmm. So again, another uh, verse talking and expanding on that aspect of Genesis of what to do with time. The thing that's interesting about time is that we, how many of you have calendars that you schedule your appointments in, right? And, and, and one thing, hopefully, if, if you're um, good about having healthy boundaries, do you allow everything to get on your calendar? That you could pop, no, because you'd, you'd never get it all done. So, so we have to, we talk about managing time, but that's kind of a misnomer because time is going to go on whether we want it to or not. What we really talk about is prioritizing our time and really saying, hey, listen, this is my time. I'm going to allow this to happen and that to happen and this to happen, etc. But here, what God does, He says, hey, listen, in six days, I'm going to create this world, I'm going to make it beautiful, etc. But then He stops, He rests on the seventh day. 
And then he sanctifies it, and he, he just takes a break on the seventh day and says, I want to prioritize time with you on that seventh day. And so here in Exodus, it con- continues that and expounds upon that. And to the Israelites and to the rest of the world, God says, hey, listen, I stopped working on the seventh day, and I'm asking you to stop working on the seventh day. In other words, he's saying, I want you to keep the Sabbath what? Holy, I want you to set it apart from all these other days. And, and, and because he says, I rested and I made spending time with you a priority. And so he's saying, my hope is that you too would rest and make time priority with me. And the interesting thing for, for those of us who maybe grew up honoring the Sabbath and being taught how to honor it, um, we maybe didn't really appreciate it. Because now as we get older, if imagine, you know, ask someone who maybe is not a Sabbath keeper and ask them, hey, listen, if, you know, one day a week you didn't have to work and you didn't have to take care of all these other things, if you could just maybe relax, what would you feel about that? And they're all saying, sign me up. I, I wish I had that day. But, but here we are, some of us growing up, with maybe not really fully appreciating what the Sabbath was to do to be to us. God is saying, listen, I want you to take a break. And it's not necessarily just a break for relaxation in the sense that, you know, just go watch TV or any of that thing. No, God is saying, I want you to rest from all of the work that you're doing. Because God knows that in our busy society, we tend to make busy doing this and busy doing that and achieving and striving. We're striving for better this and striving for a better job and we're striving for a better car, etc. And nothing's wrong with striving and wanting better for yourself. But sometimes in that striving, we tend to somehow think that if it's got to be, it's up to who? Me. And God wants to remind us to say, hey, listen, I want you to take that seventh day off to remind yourself that really, I'm in control. And that, guess what? You can trust me that I'll take care of it. And, and for some, it may be a, a bit of a scary thought because you're saying, well, my, my, my job says I have to work on the Sabbath. And, and, and God says, well, I understand that. But ultimately, Jesus is saying, do you trust me? And, and so, well, Jesus, I trust you. He says, well, if you trust me, then trust that I'll find a job that will honor the Sabbath. And, and if maybe you're not at a place where you don't trust God enough to take the Sabbath off, then really that just says that you maybe don't have at close a relationship with Jesus. And perhaps we need that prescription changed. Because Jesus says, on the Sabbath, it is a day where I want you to let me know that you trust me by resting. And by looking at our health statistics We could all use some rest. High blood pressure is rampant in our society because we're busy going here and we're busy doing that. And Jesus is saying, show me that you trust me. Rest. Accept that I am taking care of you. And maybe invest some of that time in those relationships that haven't had a chance to be expounded on because of the busyness, etc., I'm listening to a a podcast uh, Amy shared with me called The Bible Project, and I love this quote by Tim Mackey. He says, we consider ourselves masters of our time. By observing the Sabbath, we renounce our autonomy and remind ourselves that the Sabbath, along with the rest of the days, belong to who? Belong to God. Because what God is not saying, he's not saying, you just give me one day and you can do anything else that you want in the six days. No, what he's really saying is, listen, if you trust me, Allow me to remind you that I'm in control. Well, how do I do that, God? Rest. Stop striving so hard and know that I've got you. I'll take care of your bills. I'll take care of everything that you need. But trust me by resting on the Sabbath day. See, the world says that time is used to advance my purposes. But God says time is used to deepen my relationship with him and to invest it in others. Again, we said this in the beginning. To be successful in our Christian journey, we need to view life using God's perspective. So as it relates to time, well, well, hey, listen, well, well, I got this and I got that. Hey, chill, relax, because God's in control. How do I know that? Because I trust him. And letting go of our time and letting Jesus have our time shows him that we indeed trust him. So time is the first thing that we could use maybe perhaps a uh, tweak in our prescription. The second comes to what? Yeah, money. Absolutely. Whoever's got that mic, let's uh, go to Psalm 104.14. He caused the grass to grow for the cattle 
and vegetation for the service of man, that he may bring forth food from the earth. Yeah, this is referring to God and, and his ability. Saying God, God is the one who causes the grass to grow. And he, for the vegetation, for the labor of man, so that he may bring forth food from the earth. The scripture reminds us that God created the ability for man to gain wealth. So it relates to money. And, and the interesting thing is the two things that God starts to ask us to do something a little bit different with happen to be the two things that we most like to control, our time and our money. So, so what God is saying is, hey, listen, if you trust me, then trust me with some of your time and also trust me with some of your what? Money. Now, does that mean we trust him with some time and some money and then we don't trust him with the rest? No. God is saying, hey, listen, return to me a portion. We'll get to that specifically. But he's also saying, hey, give me this one Sabbath day for me. So why? It reminds me that really all of the days are his. So I can trust him and rest on the Sabbath, but I can also trust him on Sunday and on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and all the other days of the week. So, so God wants to make something clear. This is all mine, and I'm giving it to you, but I'm asking for some of it back so I can really know if you do trust me. So God created the ability for man to gain wealth. Psalm 8, 3 through 9. Oh, someone is fortunate to get a longer scripture text. Let's see what that says. Psalm 8, 3. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? Son of man, that you are care for him. You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with the glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the sea. Nine. Yeah, finish out on verse nine. O Lord, O Lord, our our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Amen. This the psalmist here is is taking a moment to consider how amazing God has created us. And have you ever thought of it like why why didn't God uh, make you an ant? He could have. And sometimes I look at these animals and I just feel so bad for them because all I have to do is just stomp them and they're dead, right? And indeed, probably some of us do. Or uh, uh, I don't believe God made cockroaches because they're just way too ugly. That had to be a sin thing, right? But, but you could have been an, an antelope, right? You could have been a lion or a gazelle. But no, 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 God, God makes us and he gives us the crowning of all creation says, listen, I'm going to give you dominion over all the earth. I'm going to give you the power and the authority to, to think and to make decisions and to have thought and to remember you get that. Not all these other animals, you. And, and the question is, who are we that God is so mindful of us? Why do we get to be the ones to make decisions? And sometimes you don't make very good decisions. But the point is that God loved us enough that he entrusted the whole earth to us. So God gives us dominion over the earth. Leviticus 27, 30 through 32. First, God creates everything and then he gives it to us. And then now he's going to do something else. Whoever has the mic, Leviticus 27, 30 to 32. Now is when God is going to ask for some of this back for himself. Every tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the trees, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. If a man wishes to redeem some of his tithe, he shall add a fifth to it. And every tithe of herd and flocks, every tenth animal of all that passes under the herdsman's staff shall be holy to the Lord. Okay, so, so just as with time, Jesus said, or God said, hey, six days, labor, work, do what you need to do, etc. Seventh day, that day is mine. The rest of them are mine too. But specifically that seventh one, I want us to spend more time together. I want you to invest it in the other relationships that potentially you have neglected because of all the striving that you've been doing. Same thing with money. God says, I made everything. I gave it all to you. But I want you to return a portion to me. God asks his children to set aside 10% of their increase as a test of trust and obedience. 
He says, it's all mine. I gave you the ability to work. I gave you the ability to create it. I'm asking that you set aside 10%. Why, God? To see if you trust me. Do you love me? Yeah. Will you give me 10%? No, you don't love me. No, I do. Yeah, you think you do. But if you love him, what does it say? If you love God, you will? Yeah, keep his commandments. And are his commandments a burden? Like, oh my goodness, another commandment? No. And if we think of his commandments as a burden, then we're missing something on the relationship side, right? Deuteronomy 16, 17. Let's look at one more thing that as it relates to money, God is asking from his people. Uh Uh-oh, who has the mic? Oh, uh, did it maybe turn off? Does it work? Okay. You're good. Go ahead. Each of you must bring a gift in proportion to the way the Lord, your God, has blessed you. Yeah, absolutely. So, so God is saying, hey, listen, there's the tithe, right? The 10% that I'm asking of all the increase, I'm asking you to return 10% to me. And then he's also saying, I'm asking you as my children to give a free will offering according to what? According to how much you have been blessed. That's right. So, so, so God has this idea. He says, listen, I, I gave it all to you. I made it all. It's all mine. Do we, or do we return it because God needs a loan? No, come on. God says, I made it all. I don't need your money. But what does he want? He wants our hearts. He wants a relationship with us. And truly, we know of anyone that we have a relationship with, if we don't ask anything from them and they don't ask anything from us, what kind of relationship is that? Fundamentally, something has to be exchanged for a relationship to, be, uh, to, to happen. And so God is saying, listen, 10% as a matter of trust. Do you trust me? Yes, God, I trust you. Return 10%. Because let's be real, right? As we do our budgets, and, and, and we all probably have enough you know, food to eat, etc., cetera, and, and, and maybe a mode of transportation or at least a way to get around. But how many of you wouldn't like to have 15% more or 20% more? If someone said, listen, I have a proposition for you. Okay, you do nothing, and I'll give you 20% more. Yeah, I'll take it, right? But, but God is saying, hey, listen, I have a proposition. Okay, God, I've given you the ability to work. Uh-huh, so you can create wealth. Yes, and I'm asking for 15 to potentially 20% of it, or you can at least 10%, and then it's according to how much I blessed you to return to me. Oh, typically when people want money from you, is that like a good thing? Oh, man, people too holy in here. Listen, I don't want people calling me asking me for money, right? It's real. We we like to keep our money because we have goals and things that we want to do with our money. It's not what we're bad people, right? But if we had way more than we needed, maybe we might give a little bit more. So so for some people, when when God says, listen, 10%, I'm asking, that is used to fund the spread of the gospel in our church. It it pays for pastors and teachers, etc. And then he's saying, on top of that, I, I want you to bring me offerings, How much? Your personal choice. And here in this local church, it's used to support local ministry. Mortgages and ministries and all these nice fancy TVs that we have, etc. And all the think carp and all that stuff. That's where that goes. But ultimately, tithe is a measure of your what? Obedience. And offering is a measure of your what? Generosity. So here's what it looks like. The world says that money is used to advance my purposes. If you went and told somebody, hey, listen, I need you to you know, return 10 to 15, maybe 20% of your income, and they're going to be like, I better be getting an ROI. What is my return on that investment? Because most of us aren't too happy just to give money away. We want to see a return on that investment. But God says, guess what? Money is used to remind us to trust him and also to invest it in others, Right? Time, God says, it's all mine. I created it. But I want that seventh day specifically for us to remind you that I created you, that you can rest in me. And then of your offerings and of all the wealth that I gave you the ability to create, I'm asking for 10% as a matter of obedience. Do you trust me? Yes, 10%. Okay. And then on top of that, offerings. How much? Hey, how much has God blessed you? Well, he hasn't blessed you at all. Then don't give anything. But that's usually not the case. Rather, I'd say never the case. God always blesses us. Again, we said to be successful in this Christian journey, we need to view life using God's perspective. So here's the question. Do we need a new prescription? Two points here, then we're done. One, if you aren't returning tithes or offerings or keeping God's Sabbath, you may need a new prescription. And that prescription 
It's a Bible study. It's a relationship. Get to know the God who gave you everything you have. Because if you truly know him, then you will not withhold anything. And, and all of us, and maybe it's not tithe, or maybe it's not uh, offerings, or maybe it's not the Sabbath, etc. But, but we all have some issues in our life that show that maybe we don't trust God as much as we think we do. But today we have an opportunity to say, you know what, maybe, maybe my prescription needs to be adjusted. But here's the other thing. If you are giving faithfully, returning tithes, offerings, and honoring God's Sabbath out of duty, you also may need a new prescription. In other words, just because you are coming to church every Sabbath and, and maybe you aren't working, etc., and, and maybe you're returning a faithful tithe and offering, but if your attitude in your heart is, I don't know, I don't, I don't like why these people are, all this money, 10%, I got bills to pay, fine, here. Ooh, I gotta say, you, you might need a change of prescription. Because I, I, I don't imagine that Jesus went to the cross like, I can't stand these people, I can't believe I'm gonna die for them. No, it's out of love. Psalm 50, 7 through 12 is a, is a reminder for some of us who might think that, man, God, geez, I think you're asking a little much from me. Like, like, man, let's read Psalm 50, 7 through 12. Hear, O people, I will speak. O Israel, I will testify against you. I am God, your God. I will not rebuke you for your sacrifices or your burnt offerings which you continually before me. I will not take a bull from your house, nor goats out of your folds. Not every beast of the field is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of thy mountains, and the wild beast of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, mm. For the world is mine and all its fullness. Yeah. So, so Jesus, uh, God's reminding us, right? His, he got to a place where his children started to give offerings and, and, and return tithe and, and give him all these offerings. But their heart was far from him. And he's saying, hey, listen, I, I don't need all this stuff. See, I see your offerings that you're giving me. And then that's good and well. But listen, I have it all. I own it all. The reason I'm giving you these tests is I want to know whether you and I are as close as you think. It's not for my benefit, it's for yours. Because ultimately, friends, it's an issue of the heart. That's all it is. Our time, which is his, our money, which he gave us the ability to create, is really his. And he's saying, if you and I know each other, then I know that when I ask you to rest from your work, you'll say, Jesus, I trust you. I don't know how the bills are going to get paid if I honor your Sabbath, but I trust you. If we're saying, Lord, okay, you've asked me to return 10%. And, and here's the thing. It's, it's one, of my, ooh, one of my pet peeves. Anytime I hear this, it's a pet peeve. Someone says, yeah, I'm um, giving tithe. We don't give tithe. What do we do? Ah, we return it. Because who does it belong to? It returns to God. Now, offering, yes, you give generously of your offering. But we do not give tithe. We, we don't pay tithe. We return tithe. When you say, I'm paying tithe, oh, you, you made it? Well, I made it. Oh, so you made the lungs that you could breathe that allowed you to go to work? No, friend. God gave us the ability to create wealth. He gives us the blessings to get jobs or to own our own businesses. And he's asking for the privilege. Because here's the thing. When you give, it does something to our selfishness. If you do it with the right heart, it says, you know what? I sure could use another fill in the blank, but instead I'm going to trust God. And I'm going to trust that wherever this money is going to go will be used for his glory. But whenever we hog it all for ourselves, do you ever have enough? No, you never do. But whenever you give, it's a good discipline to give. Remember, friends, to be successful in this Christian journey... We need to view life using God's perspective. Let's close it out with uh, Romans 8.32. Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? This is a beautiful text in Romans. Is it's talking about our victory in Christ. It goes on to say, well, what's going to separate us from God's love? Nothing. It's a reminder that love will spur us 
to honor God's Sabbath and return a faithful tithe and give generous offerings. It's only love. If it's coming from anything else out of love, it's wrong. Is there a sense of duty? Yes, there's a sense of duty. But friends, I hope that if you're married, that you married out of love, not duty. Now, once you get married and she says, do the chores, that's a duty, <laughs> right? But that duty is done out of love. And that's what God wants to remind us. As we jumpstart our year, here's the question. Do we need a new prescription? Is it maybe in our returning of tithes and giving and of offerings? Is it maybe in our observing of the Sabbath? Maybe it's in our relationships with other people. Maybe it's with anger. Maybe there's something in your life that you know deep down inside that, man, I don't think I'm looking at this or I'm dealing with the situation the way Jesus would. If you know that there's an error in your life that you need some help from Jesus, I just invite you to raise your hand. And by raising your hand, you're saying, hey, Lord, there's, there's something in my life. I can't say what it is. But, man, I know there's an area that I need a new prescription. And I'm here today at church saying, I get it, Lord. I'm at, I need to go to the doctor's office. I've, I've seen the prescription. My symptoms are bad. I'll take that prescription, Jesus. And help me day by day to eat my vitamins, his word. To spend time with him, to drink my water, make good, healthy choices. So that you and I, there's nothing between us. Let's raise your hand. Jesus, we are, we're raising my hand, mine too. I'll be the first and the highest. I need a new prescription. We need a new prescription. And more importantly than needing it, we're asking for your help. Take our glasses, broken and shattered, marred by sin, and give us your eyes to return not just our tithes and giving generously of an offering, not just setting that Sabbath day aside and making it holy, or rather you made it holy. We're celebrating that. But we need you to show us how to love you. Give us a deeper experience with you. We know that you're faithful, and we praise you for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. What a privilege it has been to learn from the Lord today and to worship together. And until we meet again next week, let these words ring in your ears. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace both now and forevermore. Amen. We'll see you next week.